Hello friends, these days we've been traveling to Greece and also to Scotland to see how they are coping with the COVID crisis. And now we are going over to Ireland to speak to Fintan Dunn of BreakfordNews.com. Hello Fintan. How are you doing Pilar? And it's great to be with you here today. Thanks. Uh, my pleasure Fintan. Um, my first question is, how are things in Ireland? Tell us about it. Okay, uh, in Ireland things are going exceptionally well, although that's not something the government wishes to speak about because it doesn't want to diminish public commitment to the lockdown. Uh, we're running certainly around about half of the projected level that this was uh, projected to run at by the most conservative forecasts. We have in the last 24 hours had a situation where 4,000 hospital beds are empty in Ireland and around about one in six of a range of private hospitals, uh, uh, hospital beds which have been contracted by the government are full. So we really have uh, an undercapacity hospital system and we're easily coping with the current level of the virus. Uh, I've been watching a lot of very interesting videos on your website. And mm -hmm. you're speaking about a lot of very interesting things. For example, the Sweden, the Sweden, the Swedish case, about the problem with uh, medical protocols, about immunity, vaccines, etc. But my question now is, because I'm very interested, because I think we are having the same problems everywhere. Yes, yeah. I want to know your your view on the Swedish uh, case, for example. Is the Swedish count still drooping? Well, yes. Sweden, uh, I'm happy to report, has uh, beaten COVID-19. Uh, they have tamed the virus, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, what we've seen in Sweden is that uh, for around about nine, ten days now, they have been descending from a peak which they hit in new cases. And we see, although deaths did spike recently, that was as a result of the COVID-19 virus getting into nursing homes, which is a problem now internationally. And really, it, it highlights how we missed the point on this one. So they did have a spike. But I'm happy to report that Sweden today has seen new intensive care cases drop to a level that hasn't been seen for a month. They had 21 new admissions to intensive care today. We haven't seen that kind of figure since back in the middle of March. They've beaten this, I think, and their no lockdown policy has now been vindicated. Uh, Fintan, your analysis on statistics and data is quite particular. Mm -hmm. How is you, what do you think, um, why did the governments uh, so badly overestimate the risk? Because we're, we're making same mistakes everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, I, I, you know, the WHO is a, is a clear reason why they overestimated risks, because the WHO was putting out mortality projections of 3.4%. And, and these kinds of statistics alarmed governments um, and they were being put out by a, a seemingly reputable organization. We now know that's perhaps an 80 times over statement of the actual risk. Um, so that was the start. Also, Wuhan scared them. Uh, Wuhan uh, happened in, and was locked down in the way it was because the Chinese missed the boat. The Wuhan had peaked before China locked it down. And that was the problem. So they'd missed the boat and had to act in an overhanded manner because of that. Then Italy, they misinterpreted Italy. Italy happened because we had a uh, perfect storm. We had uh, a virus coming in from China very early on, unchecked, spreading. We had elderly population very, very high. We had highest uh, atmospheric pollution in Europe in Milan area. And then we had uh, a complete uh, transfer of the virus into the elderly population because they live together in Italy. They don't live apart like in the Anglo-Saxon world. Uh, the elderly live in the extended family. And so this uh, created uh, a wave of cases that came forward that we've since seen does not represent the general situation. Um, so that what scared them all, yeah. 
what what is the true mortality risk for um, for people from this COVID nineteen uh, symptom? Okay, it's a shocker, and it's good news that the the mortality true mortality rate is shockingly low. And I say that because I'm I'm starting off from the 3.4% WHO figure. That was always a case fatality rate, as it's called in medicine. It means that it's the number of people we know about with the virus who have died. So if we know about 100 people who have the virus and three of them die, then we have a case fatality rate of 3%. Mm -hmm. But there could be hundreds, hundreds more who have it and never came to medical attention. And this is an issue that was resolved around about uh, four or five days ago as a report came out from a Stanford study which uh, tested people in Santa Clara County in California. There's around about two million people in the county. And what they did was they did antibody tests. They advertised on Facebook and asked them all to show up for tests. The antibody tests showed that around about three and a half percent of the population of Santa Clara County had contracted the virus. This was shocking because they only had a thousand patients who had shown up with the virus, yet here they were getting data showing there was another 69,000 people who had had the infection and hadn't needed medical attention. Uh -huh. Now that was, a, that was a game changer, Pilar. That now gave us finally the denominator. It finally gave us the size of the invisible iceberg of what you call asymptomatic cases. And it's a huge iceberg. It means that the risk has now dropped from a 3.4% case mortality rate to an infection mortality rate in the general population of one third of a tenth of a percent. So according to the, the Swedish experience and all these uh, mm -hmm. well, figures, um, do you think we should, uh, the, the, should the rest of the countries be changing the model and is the, 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 or leave the lockdown? They should definitely need to look at lifting the lockdown, uh, even on the basis that Sweden has now proven that you can do this without the, the uh, strict lockdowns we've applied. You see, this virus is extraordinarily contagious. And to a certain extent, you can't stop it. And you're really going to wear yourself out trying. So fortunately, however, it's extraordinarily benign. That ratio of 6,900 people who have no symptoms for every 100 people who show up in hospital. That's our true threat here. And that's a very, very nice ratio to have for the general population. So that means we can afford to relax because by a huge margin of 70 to one, we're going to have asymptomatic or minorly symptomatic individuals versus the ones who are exposed. And that means as well that the mortality rate risk for a younger person is now in the order of 200,000 to one, if you go back out now to work. 200, 300,000 to one is your mortality risk and it's going to decline. I think on that data, we can go back to work. Uh, we're seeing a lot of cancellations. The Camino de Santiago in Santiago Compostela mm -hmm. is being canceled. Uh, St. Patrick's Day, it's crazy, St. Patrick's Day in, in, in Ireland and all over the world mm -hmm. has been cancelled. And um, uh, Oktoberfest, etc. Um, how do you see the economic consequences playing out? Um, well, unless, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that there is a rebellion underway in the United States which is going to limit the propaganda that we've been fed about lockdowns been vital. People in the United States aren't having it, many of them, and they want to get back to work. And the Swedish model is proving that a softer lockdown will work. So hopefully we can minimize the economic damage. But we are going to have to continue social distancing. There is no way out of this unless uh, we have to maintain this virus, not on a declining basis, but simply on a basis that enables casualty departments to manage whatever the numbers coming in are. 
That's our only challenge here. But we are going to have to maintain social distancing for months in order to achieve that, many months. The good news, however, is that we can, many of us, go back to work. We can engage in gatherings of up to 50 people. And this really can be commenced immediately in most countries. Sweden has proven that model will work. Um, There's a lot of uh, interesting things in your videos. And one of them caught my attention because you were talking about pollution and the levels of pollution and the connection of the levels of air pollution with uh, COVID-19 and the explosion of COVID-19. And you're speaking about a lot of uh, information that we cannot get from the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like uh, we are having a, a, well, a war. <laughs> we are. <laughs> We're having a propaganda war, definitely. So, you know, um, the flaws in the way this is being presented by government is that you see there is no mention at all until, say, recent days of vitamin D. So why don't the government messages also say to you, as well as staying, you know, uh, away from public places, to get plenty of sun? Go out the back garden, take your clothes off and get vitamin D into you. It's terrific. The best protection you could ask for. In other words, natural and herbal remedies don't exist in government land and haven't existed. And we'll have to ask ourselves why they didn't you know, bring forward those. Similarly, natural remedies like licorice root and elderflower, which are strong antivirals and widely available. Uh, those kind of medicinals were simply not even discussed. No, the whole aim of government was to get us to stay indoors. This is a policy crafted by Bill Gates because of his takeover of the preparedness industry for, for epidemics. Uh, and this lockdown model would produce the maximum number of vaccine candidates because none of us would have immunity. Whereas if we soldier it out um, and have a loose lockdown and allow the thing to spread, we won't need Bill Gates' vaccines. So this is the battle, the battle between those trying to keep you in and keep you a customer and those who uh, want to release you and get you back to work, which I think we should do. Pinto, do you think there is a disconnect between the data and the narrative we're being told by the mainstream media? Uh, it's the lack of analysis. That's the mismatch. It's the simplistic, knee-jerk, blinkered focus on number of cases. It's the willingness of the media to look for the shot with the coffin in it, you know, rather than to consider that as, uh, as um, Professor John Lee in the United Kingdom has considered the evidence that, in fact, what we're now doing, he says, in the United Kingdom, is that sometimes an equal number of people per day are dying from non-COVID causes as COVID in excess of normal rates. The media is not talking about it. The media doesn't want to talk about that except maybe mention it once and move quickly on. But that means that we are causing another tsunami of deaths in people who are not going for the operation they needed to go for, who are not turning up for vital appointments, who have got stroke risk and are not going and seeking medical attention. So it's disgraceful what has happened, uh, Pilar. Yes, that it, we, we are having the same cons same concerns here, and, and mm -hmm. they are trying to uh, spread the word that you have to check the doctor, check your uh, heart, your your diabetes level, your etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, no? uh, but um, we here in Galicia and Spain, we are suffering uh, a lot of attacks and social networks. And we're watching a lot, of, we're facing uh, the debate about censorship, fake news. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of hours ago, for example, I was, uh, I was watching uh, a tweet from, I was seeing a tweet from a journalist from the Scotsman. Mm -hmm. And he was calling broadcast, Broadcasting Scotland, which is a, a, a broadcast, is the best broadcast. Uh, from a Scottish view, the best ever. Uh, and he was uh, calling Broadcasting Scotland unregulated media. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> pirate radio. It reminds me of uh, the the uh, founder of Radio Caroline, the pirate radio station, uh, which broadcast from at sea, died today, actually, or yesterday, and uh, a sad loss. But yes, uh, one of the consequences of this is we've all had a wake up call that Facebook and Twitter and uh, to a lesser extent, YouTube are not our friends. They're people who want to censor us based on government agendas and who want to prevent the free expression. For example, they have shut down now groups of uh, people in the, in the United States who are organizing protests against lifting the lockdown. Facebook has closed those Facebook groups. Hello. So um, the uh, I've had one of my videos taken down on, on how we shouldn't use too much uh, anti-fever medication, uh, you know, that a certain amount of fever is, is okay, in, in, you know, when you have uh, something and that if you over-medicate fever, you will take the temperature down too much and that's not good. No, they took that off. So, you know, this is um, peer-reviewed information I'm providing there. So we, we've been shown that we do not own the social media we thought we owned, that we are, we are increasingly being policed. And uh, we'll have to go back to independent sites and perhaps use social media just as networking places, but put the content where they can't take it off. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, there's a lot of uh, lessons to learn about this uh, COVID-19, this global experience uh, in a human level, in a social level, probably in a spiritual level too. But uh, from your view, what lesson do we need to learn from this? Um, the first lesson I'd learn from it is that the um, 2008 financial crash uh, didn't teach us the lesson. It's taken a second bout of emergency to teach us the lesson that when it comes down to it, the well-heeled, the well-off, the corporate sector and the bureaucracy will act in its own interests with disregard for the tragic and desperate consequences for the vast majority of the middle class and lower middle class. And they've done it again with their lockdown policies, which have destroyed our small business economy. And the corporates will be able to borrow money at low interest rates in order to move into the space left by small business. So there's this is yet another uh, encroachment of the economic space by the corporate sector led by pharma. We've got to learn the systemic lessons there. And we've also got to disconnect epidemic planning from pharma's hands and from the hands of Bill Gates. Um, we've got to put planning for these kinds of things back in the hands of public policymakers who develop long-term plans in the public interest. Uh, and we've also got to start actual testing of vaccines safety testing and uh, demand demand safety standards for vaccines and rein them in because that's their next cash cow. We've also got to remove the um, the exemptions from liability which has been given to vaccine manufacturers. These exemptions create a lure for greed and profit and uh, that promise of being able to market any old crop and then uh, not be sued for it is a license to print money. We've got to take that away. Well, Fenton, thank you very much. I could talk to you uh, for hours because you, you have such a fantastic website, breakfornews.com. And that's, that's the beautiful, beautiful truth, as you say. The beautiful truth. And you'll also get uh, me on YouTube on Fenton Dunn, just F-I-N-T-A-N-D-U-N-N-E on YouTube. You'll find my channel. And it's great to talk to you again, PLR. Um, we've spoken before and you're always tuned in. <laughs> so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, very touched because I would love to uh, follow uh, the, the development of this mm -hmm. crisis. So if you agree, we'll, we'll talk again soon. OK, that will be great. Thanks very much, PLR. Thank you very much. Vinton. Thank you very much. And you all, you know what? You have to do, share the video, share the info, and visit Fenton's website. Okay, bye.